This morning, we're going to hit rock bottom. Yeah. Let's begin with a blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher kedishanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la sok bedivrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to engross ourselves in words of Torah. All right. This is the seventh reading from the book of Genesis, and its name is Bayatse. 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 Yeah. Which means, and he went out. The title comes from the first verse of the reading, which says, and Jacob went out from Beersheba. This portion tells the story of Jacob's flight from his brother Esau, his vision at Bethel, his employment with his uncle Laban, and his marriage to the two sisters, Rachel and Leah. Jacob's double marriage results in a baby-bearing contest that gives him 11 sons. And at the end of the portion, Jacob leaves Laban and returns to the land of Canaan, but not before Laban tries to stop him. But today we're going to uh, look at probably one of the most widely known stories in the Bible. Of course, that, uh, it's the dream that has become known as Jacob's Ladder, okay? And as a matter of perspective, we need to remember that when Jacob went to Haran, he was uh, somewhere around 60 years old, okay? He was not a young teenager running from his hot-headed brother. He was 60 years old thereabouts. Depending on how you counted uh, the years, it depends. Uh, some said, no, he was 56, 57, and other people said, no, he was uh, uh, older than that, 67, or anywhere, somewhere around 60 years old. He was 60 years old and unmarried, still living at home. Oh, boy. Okay. I'm wondering if in Jacob's mind, fleeing to Haran, Haran seemed like uh, progress to him. He was, he was leaving home, but it, probably not. Jacob knew that his grandfather Abraham had been originally called out of that land up there in Mesopotamia and brought to Canaan. He knew that Abraham had forbidden Isaac from traveling back to that place, even for the purpose of finding a wife. Jacob's flight from Canaan to Haran seemed like two steps backward in, uh, in the you know, plan of God. You know, two steps forward, one step back, you know, all, all the way. On the contrary, God would use Jacob's years of exile to prosper him because, you know, when he went up there, well, the heads of the tribes of Jacob, of, of Israel, were born to Jacob while he was in Haran. God remained with him, watched over him, and prospered him. By the end of the Torah portion, Jacob will return to Canaan wealthy and successful. But at the beginning of his journey, Jacob had to, uh, you know, he was plodding north, and, uh, you know, it, it just had to be to him, heading up to uh, Haran, he was a totally defeated man. You know, yeah, he was on his way uh, to find a wife among his kinsmen, but in reality, he was fleeing home to save himself from his brother Esau. He was sent away from his home without a bride price. Okay, they sent him up to get a bride, but hey, you're on your own, buddy, and try to find one. It was uh, required for the potential husband to present his prospective father-in-law with a dowry. You remember Eliezer had a large dowry from Abraham, something like 10 camels all loaded down with gold and silver and spices and myrrh and all sorts of things when he went to search for Rebekah. Jacob had nothing, zero, nada. Instead of being uh, home, heir to a large estate because he now you know, had the birthright and he had the blessing, so he was the legitimate heir to Isaac's 
uh, vast estate of cattle and slaves and servants and, and lands. But now he's homeless and he's uh, uh, in fear of his life. It took him a couple of days to walk up there from Beersheba to, to uh, Luz, which is where he laid down for the night. And uh, it would take him another month to get back up to, uh, get up to Haran because he was taking the, the routes uh, that uh, the uh, people normally took in those days. And so after this couple of days walking, uh, Jacob arrived at the city of Luz. He camped out in the open, probably because he didn't get to the town uh, quick enough before the sun went down, and they closed the gates up. You know, you talk about rolling the sidewalks up at sundown. Well, they did that in the old days. It, once it got dark, the gates were closed, and you didn't get in. You just didn't get in. You were stuck outside. So, Bible says he used a stone for a pillow or put his, his head behind, beside a stone. Uh, but anyway, it's no more soft living. Now, some translations say that the stone was beside his head. Some said that he used a stone for a pillow. But it was, it was not uncommon for people when they camped out in the open like that to put stones around their head and then they would sleep with their head up inside the stones, you know, with the stones around them. Well, why did they do that? It was a defense on somebody coming up and bashing their head with a Louisville slugger, you know, and uh, or chopping it off with the uh, Ginsu chef knife. Um, Jacob was in a precarious position. He took, you know, he took precautions. So even though Jacob's physical security was possibly compromised by being alone in a strange land, he did fall asleep. He was tired. And when he did, he had a dream, a magnificent dream, one of those dreams that stay with you for a lifetime. Have any of you ever had a dream that actually you can tell and you can remember it today? You know, if you've ever had those kind of dreams, most of my dreams I can't remember from the time I get up out of the bed until I'm standing up straight. You know, that's just, that's just the way it is. But Jacob had this dream. In this dream, he saw a stairway. Some people call it a ladder, but it was more, more properly a stairway that extended from earth to heaven. Angels were ascending and descending the stairs. And at the top of the stairs was Hashem himself, God himself. It says Adonai. We'll read it again. Surprisingly, Adonai was standing on top of it. He said, I am Adonai, the God of your father, Abraham, and God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your seed. Your seed will be as the dust of the land, and you will burst forth to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Same thing he told Abraham. And in you and in your seed. Behold, I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not forsake you until I have done what I have promised you. So at the very lowest point of Jacob's life, he was visited by the creator of the universe. Incredibly, God was uh, not, uh, he was not standing over Jacob at the top of the celestial uh, staircase with a handful of lightning bolts, you know, because Jacob, he was kind of a, he was kind of a sneaky fellow, you know, he had cheated and, and schemed, but God was not standing up there, you know, like uh, some mythical creature uh, with the lightning bolts hurling them down like, uh, uh, you know, for, to punish him. No, even though Jacob maybe deserved some kind of punishment, he received mercy. God was there to upgrade the Abrahamic covenant to version 3.0. Adonai would be with Jacob wherever he went, not just when he was in the land. A little bit further, it's more of a, more of a promise that, uh, than he gave, uh, that God gave Abraham. Jacob would soon lead the promised land to live in a foreign land for 20 years, or as one commentator opined, it's almost 40 years depending on how you count it and, and so on. So they, they said that he could have been there for 
40 years. Now, most of us have, you know, I grew up with the idea that he was there for 20 years, but uh, uh, having uh, 11 sons within a space of uh, uh, seven years within, uh, within, you know, even though you had four wives there, that's a lot, you know, and especially then that would put them all about the same age, you know, within seven years of each other. And so you would not have had Joseph way down toward the tail end of all of the brothers. You know, he, they uh, talk about Joseph being so much younger than the rest of them. And so whether it's 20 years, 40 years, it doesn't matter. It's an interesting take on his time uh, in Haran. It, it really makes no difference whether it was 20 years or 40 years. It's irrelevant to the story. God said he would be with Jacob wherever he was, and he was. He was with him. No matter how many years, God was with him. God's promises have, uh, have conditions, though, but as far as I can tell you, they have no expiration date. Let me say that again. God's promises may have conditions, you know, if, but, or if, then, you know, those kind of things. If you will do this, then I will bless you. If you don't do this, I will not bless you, okay? But it doesn't have an expiration date. It is forever. If we keep his commandments, he will bless his people. But if we don't follow God's word, he is under no obligation to bless us. So there are many interpretations as to the meaning of the angels in Jacob's dream. The angels ascending and descending represents, some say, the rise and the fall of nations. Empires may come and go, but God's chosen people are still standing. You know, that's one interpretation. The angels are guardians sent to protect Jacob on his journey. That's another interpretation. The ascending angels were carrying the prayers of God's people up, the, up to the heaven, and answered prayers were being carried back down to the petitioner by the descending angels. Now, um, the answer is probably maybe, you know, all of the above. Could be. We don't know. The meaning of the angels is not particularly important as the message from God. He said he would bless Jacob with the same promise of Abraham and Isaac. Jacob had bought the birthright of the firstborn. Fifty years later, he deceived poor old nearly blind Isaac and received the much-coveted blessing associated with the firstborn. The birthright and blessing had been prophesied to uh, Rebekah before Jacob and Esau were born. God didn't need the help of Rebekah and Jacob to accomplish his purposes. You know, God does not need our help to accomplish things. Sometimes he lets us help, and he tells us to do certain things, but in terms of if, if we don't do it, it won't get done. <coughs> well, I will point you to Esther, what did Mordecai say? If you don't rise up, somebody else will. And God's purposes will be accomplished. Jacob followed the Lord and uh, let him handle the situation. Had Jacob followed the Lord and let him handle the situation, maybe it would have turned out much better off for him, but he didn't. But God didn't hold it against Jacob. And I suspected that, uh, that Jacob's uh, time in Haran with uh, less than stellar father-in-law, you know, uh, was colored somewhat by the duplicitous behavior of Jacob in Beersheba. You know, maybe karma had come around and, and uh, taken care of him. Sin is all, always has consequences. Laban, Jacob's uncle, deceived Jacob at every turn. Jacob was victimized by the deceit of Laban, uh, as uh, was Esau and uh, by you know as was Esau by Jacob's own hand there's another aspect of Jacob's ladder that uh, we should explore other than God's mercy to Jacob despite Jacob's less than sterling character Yeshua told Nathaniel you will see the heavens open and, and angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man now what did that mean really um uh, as far as we know from the, the gospel record, Nathaniel never did receive an apocalyptic vision in which he saw angels ascending and descending upon the master. So in what sense 
did he see the angels ascend and descend upon the master. Nathaniel and the disciples saw Yeshua working in the power and authority of heaven, which in apocalyptic literature is always illustrated by and described by angels, okay? The miracles, everything in apocalyptic literature of uh, the Hebraic apocalyptic literature uh, was almost always talked about angels. Now, that is to say that the angels of God ascended and descended upon him at his request and his command, okay? So basically the angels did what Yeshua told them to do. The latter image, um, uh, you know, it, it goes on to say, surprisingly, Adonai was standing on top of it. I like that, surprisingly, because he didn't have to do that, you know. The latter image illustrates the master's words, no one comes to the Father but through me. So there again, Yeshua is the ladder, the stairway. No one gets to the Father but through Yeshua. The ancient idolaters instinctively understood that a great separation existed between man and God or the, the gods as the case may have been in their mind. Um, you know, we still have that today. What's that song? I've, I've mentioned it several times. God is there watching us from a distance. No, he's not. He's right as close. He's right here. In, you know, right here. The, uh, the mighty ziggurat uh, towers, you know, like the Tower of Babel, the, their lofty high places, tall altars, all represented attempts to span that distance from earth to the heavens. Even the highest place, highest high place, does not reach high enough. You can go to the top of Mount Everest, and you're still as close to God up there as you are in the Dead Sea, okay, the lowest place in the earth. Even the Tower of Babel did not reach to heaven. The scripture says, For God came down to the city and the tower which the sons of man had built. So if they had built it to heaven, he wouldn't have had to come down. He'd have just walked over. No, he said he went down to it. The same might have been said for all of our religious impulses. The stars, they're always just beyond our reach. Uh, our reach. Heaven on earth is a myth as we attempt holiness for, by our own efforts. Man's best attempts to bridge the gap fail. The tall towers and the tottering ladders we ascend come to nothing, really. For if we ascend to God, we must ascend upon a ladder that he himself had extended from heaven to earth. Okay, let me say that again. If we're going to go to him, we have to travel the ladder that he extends to us. What was that ladder? It was Yeshua. God has extended the Messiah to us from above. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have recognized this picture. It's in, in uh, Brazil. It is awesome to go up there to that and just stand there and look at it. Um, I've, I've had the occasion to do that and see it quite a few times in my year, uh, months and so forth of living in Brazil. It's just awesome to see that. But Yeshua said, I have come down from heaven. The Messiah is the way of ascent, he says. I am going up to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. That's in John 20, 17. He is the son of Jacob, an Israelite, and yet angels ascend and descend upon him. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, For God has put all things in subjection underneath his feet. But when the psalmist says that all have been put on in uh, subjection, it is clear that this does not include God himself. Of course not. Who put all things under Messiah. Now, when all things become subject to him, then, all, then the Son of Man will also become subject to the one who put all things under him, so that God may be all in all. Yeshua bridged the gap, the space between heaven and earth. He is that ladder to heaven uh, that the, the angelic forces were, were going up and down on. 
Another Jacob, uh, this time the, the brother of Yeshua. You know, you may know him in the Bible. They call him James, but his, his real name was Yaakov. Um, and uh, Yaakov ben Yosef, okay, that was his real name. And he wrote in the book of James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So the ladder to heaven was also a ladder to earth. The angels were not static. They were going up and down. We cannot be static either. We must move. It, you know, it takes a live fish to swim upstream. Dead fish, they just float downstream. Make the move. Draw near to God. Climb up that ladder. He will come down to you. Too often people think that they are at the end of their rope with no hope of, of uh, you know, anything, they, and they just stop moving. They reach rock bottom. They're paralyzed by fear, lethargy, depression. They have hit rock bottom. The pillow is a stone. That does not need to be you. Start climbing that ladder. It's right there. You are a spiritual child of Abraham. The promises of God are there for you. Reach out for them. James said, humble yourselves in the sight of Adonai and he will lift you up. So when you're at that bottom of that, you know, literally there at the bottom, don't let depression overtake you. Don't let all of the things that have surrounded you defeat you because, you know, in him we are not defeated. We just have to reach out to the Lord. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not making light of any of this. You know, said, oh, yeah, just reach out there and get what you deserve. That's, okay, that is a word. Okay, I'm off my script right now, okay? <laughs> deserve. That word just drives me absolutely wackadoodle. Because every commercial, get the sleep that you deserve. Get the meal that you deserve. Get the car that you deserve. What makes them think that you deserve anything unless you work your took us off and pay for it? Then that's why you deserve something. You don't just, by virtue of your good looks, deserve something, you know? If that be the case, you know, Charlie would be a billionaire back there, you know? <laughs> It says, humble yourselves in the sight of Adonai and he'll lift you up. So what happened to Jacob when he woke from his dream? Quite literally, he was scared to death. He was just absolutely scared. He says, so he was afraid. He says, how fearsome this place is. There, this is none other than the house of God. There, this must be the gate of heaven. Now, this idea of the gate of heaven was a common mythological idea among ancient men, that there was a place someplace in the world that was the actual gate to heaven. There's also a place in Israel that I've been to that they called it the gates of hell or the, uh, I forget, the, the Gehenna or something. But it's actually, it's, a, it's a, um, a cave, a tunnel thing like that that has, um, it has, um, I don't know, volcanic something activity up underneath. And every once in a while, you get a little bit of a, a whiff of sulfur coming up out of, the, out of that thing as, as it's heated up. So they called that the gates of hell. Well, Jacob is saying, ooh, this must be the gates of heaven. But now then Jacob made a vow to God. He's reaching out. He's starting to climb that ladder. He said, if God will be with me and watch over me on this way that I am going and provide me food to eat and clothes to wear, and I return to Shalom, and return in Shalom to my father's house. Okay, now here's a word in, in your, your, uh, your translations. says, then Adonai will be my God. But you know what? Most translations do say, then Adonai will be my God. But if you look at the Hebrew, it, it says, ve haya. Ve haya. It doesn't say az haya. Okay? So what difference does that mean? Okay, it's all Greek to you, right? No, it's actually Hebrew. Okay. What Jacob says here is not a conditional vow telling God that if you do what I want you to do for me, then you can have the privilege of being my God. No, he's not saying that at all. 
They're, again, getting into that word, that deserve. You know, you deserve to be my God because look at me. No, he's not saying that at all. No, he is affirming that if God protects him and brings him back his home and will be his God, then Jacob will make this place a place, uh, a monument of worship. That's, if you look at the Hebrew, tear the Hebrew down, and of course there are no uh, commas anywhere in there, you know, to kind of get you there. But if you take those phrases, it makes a whole lot more sense to me that, as he's saying, if God is going to do all this for me and he's going to be my God, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this place, this, this place here, and they call it the place, I'm going to make this place a place of worship to God. I'm going to anoint this, this place. He took that cold, hard stone that was his pillow when he was at the lowest point of his life, and he turned it into an opportunity of worship. Often, we hit rock bottom like Jacob before God can get our attention. You know, have you ever been to that point? I know some of you have because I know some of your personal histories. You hit rock bottom. Sometimes God has to hit you between the eyes with a two before before he can get your attention. Don't be that guy, you know? Don't be that guy. It's a hard place to be. But when you, when you do get to that rock bottom place, that hard spot down at the bottom, you're in the dungeon, be sure that guess what? There is a stairway to heaven from right there, from wherever you are. We have an avenue that allows us to reach out to him. Remember, he is not willing, what did he say? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to fail. He doesn't want any of us to uh, miss being with him throughout eternity. Remember that, that other, that last ex explanation for the angels going up and down? What was it? It's our prayers, you know? That's the one I really like, that our prayers are carried up to the throne of grace, and then the answer comes back on the wings of angels. Yeshua is that ladder, the conduit for our com <coughs> communication to heaven. Reach out to him this morning for all your needs because he is there. He's extending uh, his own personal self-being. He is the ladder. He is extending it from heaven down to earth so that you know, we can reach on to him and that make that, that first step toward spending eternity with Yeshua. <clears throat> Could we stand?